This land is a wilderness. Dry, barren, cold. All around us is division, hatred surrounding all sides. Fingers pointing, insults slinging. We put our hope in kings. We put our hope in possessions, even in family. But we were left with nothing, nothing but despair. We long for God to tear the skies apart, to descend, to come again, to do awesome things like he did long ago when we weren't looking for it. Look at us, God. We are your people. Don't you remember? When will you heal the hurt? When will you knit together the torn? When will you turn our despair into hope? Well, good morning and welcome. It's good to be together on this, the, the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Pastor Mike. I'm pastor here at OCC. And we're probably not ready for this, but Merry Christmas. It is the first Sunday of Advent, and we start to move towards, towards Christmas. If you don't know what Advent is, Advent is, is a word which simply means arrival. Uh, it's a season where historically people have uh, taken these four weeks before Christmas to uh, look backwards and to look forward, to, to look back to the first coming of Jesus, his first arrival, and to look forward to his, his, re his return. And that, that promise that we have is rooted in our, the hope that we have. This is what we're looking for. And so each week during Advent, uh, we, take, uh, we light a candle representing uh, four key words or key images, key thoughts that build ar around this theme of hope, of love, of joy, of, of peace. And then on Christmas Eve, we light the, uh, what's sometimes called the Christ candle or the, the fifth, fifth candle. And all of this is really associated with the hope that we have because of Jesus. And hope is really important. We're going to talk more about hope this morning uh, because it's absolutely vital in this day and this age. Uh, but before we, before we do that, and the clerks are going to come and uh, light the candle this morning, but let me pray for us. And so Holy Spirit, we invite you to work in our hearts, in our lives. We invite you to change things, to convict us, to challenge us, to encourage us. And so, Father God, thank you for this Christmas season. Thank you for Advent. Thank you for the first arrival of your Son, the long-awaited Messiah, the one who promised thousands and thousands of years ago before he came that he would come and save his people from their sins. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the story that we get to remember in these weeks. Thank you for the historical accounts of them. Thank you for the words you've given us. Thank you for the details, for the veracity, the truth of how you came. And so, Lord, thank you for helping people, people who are sometimes weak in faith, like sometimes we are, as we go into this season, Lord, as we go into these next weeks leading up to Christmas. And I pray that your Holy Spirit work, in, work within us. Not just us here at OCC, but in the church in this city, a church across this country, a cur this church around the globe. Give us hope, Lord. Remind us of our hope. Remind us of the foundation that we stand on, the kingdom that we've inherited that can never be shaken. Remind us of this kingdom, Lord, because there's so much shaking going on in our world, so much shaking going on in our hearts and our lives. And so we need you, Lord, to still to comfort your people. Holy Spirit, you are our comforter, and so we thank you that you want to do this work. And today, as we look at some Old Testament prophecies and their fulfillment, Lord, would you work in an amazing way. So I pray for everybody listening here, for those who know you, for those who don't yet know you. Would you call all of us to yourself, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'm going to invite the, the Clark family to come, and they're going to read and uh, light the Advent candle.
I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We are glad, whether we drove in or we logged on, we are glad to be here in this community with this family. It is a place of joyful hope, of radical welcome. It's a place where together, we can wait in wondrous anticipation of the kingdom to come. The prophet Isaiah wrote, nevertheless, there would be no more gloom for those who are in distress. Nevertheless, there will, oh, oh. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee and the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Luke records uh, the story of Simeon who took the baby Jesus in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the nations, a light of, for revelation to the Gentiles in the glory of your people Israel. We light this candle as a sign of our hope, our joyous hope that we can be restored, our faith restored, our strength restored, our confidence restored, our joy restored, as we watch and wait with all God's people for the promise to be fulfilled. Well, good morning, everyone. Morning. And uh, welcome out of the house of the Lord this morning. Um, I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning. And uh, it's really great that God gives us the hope. And that's what we're talking about. The whole thing is about hope this morning. Um, and you'll forgive me if I uh, can't reach the high notes this morning. I've got a little bit of bronchitis stuff going on, so I know what that's all about. But if those that don't know me, uh, my name's Ray, and this is my daughter Emily, my wife Brenda. Alan back here on the base, and this is Andrew, <laughs> and we have Scott on uh, for percussion this morning, so I just wanted to introduce everybody this morning, and uh, we picked some songs this morning uh, that will give you hope, so the words in them will uh, talk about, you know, uh, what God has done for us, and he's for us, and we mishmashed it with a bit of uh, Christmas stuff too, so uh, I invite you to stand with us this morning, let's sing this together. Son to free us, hold me in his love. 
Amen. I'll invite our uh, boys and girls to uh, head out to uh, OCC Kids. And so Doug's at the back and he'll direct you which, which direction, which age groups go which way. Excellent. I want to highlight a couple of things that are uh, happen, happening over this uh, next, next, next month. Uh, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, there's a baby shower for, for M- Emily, as you can tell. This is probably one of the last times she's going to be leading worship for a little, little while. Uh, a little less lung capacity there. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, next uh, on, the, on the 11th uh, out at uh, the, the Gillette's uh, farm. Uh, one of the things we're doing ag- again this Christmas season, this Advent season, is our Mary and Joseph project. I should have brought them up with me. We've done this in the past for a few few years, and we didn't do it last year. We've got Mary and Joseph, and we encourage you to sign up and uh, take these characters and then uh, meet up with somebody and uh, just share share together over, over whether it's a meal, whether it's over a cup of coffee, whether it's at your place or at Mariposa or Appalachian's or, or, or wherever. And so let me encourage you to... Uh, to do that, it's simple. There's a sign-up list out at the uh, the welcome welcome center, and uh, you can get all the all the deta- details there. 
One of the other things that's happening is, is, is grief share. Uh, a one uh, Sunday, uh, a one, one session event called Surviving the Holidays, and, and John Blythe is, uh, is, uh, is leading that. And it's good to have you with us this morning, John. John's off and away preaching other places, so it's really good to have John, John with us this, this morning. Um, and then in a couple of weeks' time, on the, the 12th of December, is the, um, we have the opportunity to uh, support the Salvation Army. Uh, with their their kettle program, and so uh, there's we've we've got that day. So again, there's a sign up list out in the welcome center, and so s- sign up for whatever time uh, fits 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 you. One of the things um, we want to uh, do this year, it's a little little bit different, uh, is as we think of Christmas, I want you to think of three words. Um, we use a lot of words and phrases to describe Christmas. So, if Rebecca, if we can go to that slide, I thank you. Uh, to help us focus our thinking during this Advent season, just write a, a three-word statement about what this season, whether it's Advent or Christmas, me- means to you. And uh, we'll, why don't you post that either on our website or on our fa- Facebook group. And if you feel a little bit more adventuresome, Write a paragraph that describes that. Uh, send, 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 send us the, that description, and we'll, we'll work that into a variety of things over, over this next month. So three words to, uh, to post on our, our uh, OCC web or on our, our Facebook, Facebook group, and then for the more adventuresome, write a paragraph that just expands on, on that. One more, one more thing. This uh, this Saturday morning is our um, is a combination of OCC and a really a women's connection bre- breakfast in Theater One. And in order to get ready for that, we've got a bunch of couches in there that need to move down to Theater Four. So if you can uh, give us a hand after the service, that would be much appreciated. So we can move those so we're ready for that, and also ready for uh, the use of that space for when it gets cold. Uh, that we'll use that room again for uh, the emergency warm- warming center. So, uh, thanks, Pastor Mike. I'll just invite you to stand with us if you, if you can this morning, and let's just sing a couple of more songs to the Lord. Yeah. 
sing it out to him now. give us, Lord, this time of the year. Lord, that's really what it's all about. It's not about presents or glitter or, you know, buying things even for people. It's about you, Lord, that gave us salvation through a little baby. We thank you, Lord, for that hope that you give us. And we just pray to renew that in our hearts this season, Lord. And then just uh, let it bloom, Lord. Let it, let it flourish you know, to the people around us, Lord. May we be a, a light and the, the salt, Lord, that, uh, that people really need in this crazy and wacky world we live in now. That's right. And so we just give you the honor and praise and the glory that you deserve, Lord, because we love you this morning. Amen. 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 Thanks, everyone. Please be seated. So this morning we're going to be looking at some Old Testament prophecies and New Testament fulfillment. And I don't know whether you noticed or not, but when we were singing that Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, there are so many Old Testament illustrations, allusions, pictures that are in, 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 in that song. And so one of the things we'll, we'll notice uh, over these, uh, I just lost everything here. One of the things we're going to we're going to notice over, over these this next while is is some of these um, uh, pictures that are that are there in the Old Testament. You know, we, as I said, we're, we're we're focusing so much on 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 this image of of hope because uh, it's absolutely essential. We have so many things that drive us towards that. Our world, our culture, and, and the season tries to, to conjure up these ingredients, you know, of, of hope, uh, of joy, of, of peace, of love. But we, our culture really doesn't have the underlying foundation to sustain those things. So it ends up being this, this often this facade, this thing that we pretend, this lens that we, we put over life, and we pretend that we're really hopeful, and, and we've got this peace, and that we're, we're, we're joyful, and, and that shopping's going to bring those things, or needing more food, and, and those things just do the opposite. So here's what I want to ask us as the beginning of Advent season this year, as, as, as your pastor, as we move into the season, can we refuse to fake it? Can we refuse to fake it? You know, God doesn't hold out hope and joy and love for, and peace for us and say, here, put this stuff on. I don't care how you feel, but just put them on. Just, just pretend. Just act like that. You know, nowhere in the Bible does God say that. He invites us to come just as we are. He invites us to come with our burdens, with our weariness, with our frustration, with our anxieties. With... He wants us to be real. He wants us to be authentic. And in the midst of us coming like that, he offers us his presence. He offers us his joy. He offers us his peace. Not exclusive from those situations, but in the midst of those situations. So let's not turn Christmas into something that's not. 
You know, over the next month, you know, uh, if you haven't already started decorating, you will be decorating your house, I'm sure. Janice puts up lots of Christmas decorations, and many of them focus around the word joy. Uh, last Christmas, uh, one of our granddaughters asked, Nana, how come you have so much joy? You know, because there was joy e e e everywhere. You know, we don't want to go through, just, just go through the motions as a church. We exist to know Jesus, to make him known. And we want to know him more and more in these next few weeks. Jesus said that, that the Holy Spirit is within you. And so there'll be like rivers of living water flowing out. And so Advent, these weeks leaving up to Christmas is a chance for us as Jesus people to take all of the packaging of hope and peace and love and joy that our culture goes after it and connect it to the experience of knowing Jesus. You know, and, and this whole theme this year is rooted in a prayer of Paul's in, in Romans chapter 15. And I've been thinking about this and meditating on this for the last little, little while. Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You know, that prayer has the same ingredients as Christmas, doesn't it? Hope, joy, peace, it's all there. But did you notice that this is a, a hope sandwich? It begins with hope, it ends with hope. You know, Paul calls God the God of hope. That's, that's the name he gives him, the God of hope. He's saying that hope is a characteristic, an essential characteristic of God's nature, God's character. It's part, it's who our God is. And that means for us, that there's, there's a reason to believe that there is good ahead of us. Not, not as a prosperity gospel, but there's always reason to believe that there's good that lies ahead of us. Our God is the God of hope. Our, our God's not the God of, of false hope. He's the God of hope. And, and through your life, and for many of us in this, this season, we're experiencing the results of not putting our trust in God, but putting our hope in, in false hopes. You know, in, whether it's career or family, ambitions, resources, hope in a world that's not going to shake, hope in an environment that's not going to attack us. There, there's all kinds of false hope. But our God's the God of hope. Now, at times, I can be a little bit pessimist, pessimistic. And, and part of what that means is that even my relationship with God, one of my, one of my struggles is is to, to wrestle my, my, my pessimism down and to take the lies captive. And, and so, and, to, and part of doing that is praying the prayer of the psalmist. Psalms 27, 13 says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. That, that's the prayer of someone who knows that their relationship with the God of hope will not disappoint because God is so trustworthy. And then as we look at some of these Old Testament prophecies in just a moment and then see the New Testament fulfillment, we, 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 we need this setup. And it says, wait for the Lord. And, and for God's people, it was sometimes hundreds of years. And we get frustrated when we gotta wait 10 minutes. If our God is the God of hope, it means he is trustworthy. You know, we're, we're, we're living in a, in a famine of hope. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is we've lost sight of the trustworthiness of God. You know, the, the church used to cling to the truthfulness, the trustworthiness of the word of God. And, and the scripture's always been attacked by, by those outside the church. But Today, there's, there's a movement within God's people. In the name of a, a pursuing authentic relationship with Jesus, there's a lot of people who say, well, we've we got to reinterpret the, the scripture in light of modern values and the modern way of seeing the world. And so we, we go, begin to only allow God to speak into areas that we don't find offensive. And that begins to undermine the foundation of our life in Christ, to undercut the reality that God has spoken. We've lost sight of the, the trustworthiness of the words that God has spoken. And then we wonder why we lose hope. God's Holy Spirit breathed words for us so we can know what he's promised, what his story is, how we fit, and what our future is as God's people. And our fa this famine of hope has led to pervasively low levels of joy and peace. 
because we don't really trust God. We don't really believe that prayer of Psalm 27, verse 13. We don't really believe that we'll see the goodness of God in the land of the living. We don't really believe that we have an anchor in him, that no matter what happens in this life, we can still see and taste his goodness. And so what I'm praying for these next four weeks, what I'm praying in the season of Advent is we become a people who experience joy and peace coming from a deep connection to the trustworthiness, to the goodness of God, that we become a people who the God of hope is able to fill with his joy and with his peace and with his love so the Holy Spirit can cause us to abound more and more in love. We have hope because the foundation can't be, can't be shaken. Joy and peace and love are what happens when the goodness of God becomes our most basic reality. That God is good, that he loves, that he has spoken, and that nothing can stop his words from coming to pass. The most basic reality is this whole world can shake. Everything can be taken from us and we can still see and understand that we have a good, good God who is with us in the midst of all of this. So over these next four weeks, we're going to look at some prophecies, some from Micah, most of them from uh, Isaiah, that get fulfilled in the New Testament writings. And Matthew and Luke in particular record those four. You know, these prophecies, some of them are 700 years or so before Jesus came. We want to be a people who can help our, our culture, our world, connect to God. Everyone wants hope and joy and peace and love, but they're not found and the things that we often go looking for. As church, as God's people, we need to experience those things. And so here's the first Old Testament prophecy that's fulfilled in the New Testament that we're going to look at. Light breaks into darkness. You know, some 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah recorded these words. This is in Isaiah chapter 9. There will, there will be no gloom for those who are in distress. Or the, the word we can also translate as anguish. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now, in order to make sense of that, we also need to read Isaiah 8. Yeah, that's always a good principle. If you want to interpret, understand what a passage of Scripture says, look at the passage, the verses, the chapter before and after it. We read it in context. And Isaiah chapter 8 is ugly. At the end of Isaiah 8, we have a picture of a people who are frustrated, who are desperate, who are angry, so frustrated and desperate and angry that they're cursing and cursing God. It says verse 21, distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land when they're famished. They'll become enraged and looking upward, they'll curse their king and their God. They'll look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and they'll be thrust into utter darkness. Ever been there? Some of you are thinking, yeah, I've, 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 I've been there. This is Isaiah 8. They're, they're, they weren't willing to trust the word of God. They, they had no time for, for what the prophet was declaring. They hated what he was telling them because they refused to accept that their present and their future was actually in God's hands. And so when Isaiah speaks these words, they, they, they shut their ears and they, they became frustrated. They became angry. They began to rage because they were fighting to stay in control. They were fighting for, for power. They are fighting in, in ways that so many are doing today. Now, that's not just a picture of ancient Israel at the end of Isaiah 8. There's obviously the historical context there. But it's a vivid picture of the human condition, wandering, distressed, hungry, enraged, looking up, cursing God, looking out on distress and darkness. At the end of chapter 8, they will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. Everything's settling in on them. And they will be thrust into utter darkness, thrust into thick darkness. We need to know, and maybe it's a bit of an aside, the Bible never shies away from naming our darkness. The Bible never shies away from, from anger, from hatred, from cursing God, from people who are frustrated and desperate. Sometimes, as, as, as God's people, we, we, we shy away from that, from inviting those realities, inviting those conversations. But that's a mistake. It doesn't reflect the heart of God. You know, read, read the Psalms. And, 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 and the psalmist cries out to God, he laments. 
God himself, by his spirit, breathes out these words that include the depictions, and we've looked at that in Habakkuk the last couple of weeks, of people who are struggling with him. It's okay to acknowledge that. It's where you are. It's okay. Advent is for you. See, God paints our darkness. He paints our darkness with realism because he wants to speak to us in the midst of the dark. That's why Jesus came to us in the dark. Isaiah 9, there'll be no gloom for those who are in anguish. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. It's interesting. When you, when you look at the text here, this is, a, this is a prophecy for the future. Isaiah is writing this some 700 years before Jesus was born. Uh, but, but Isaiah is using past tense verbs. It means that this prophecy is so sure, so certain in Isaiah's eye, so foundational, so unshakable, it's like it already happened. God spoke it. Isaiah says the promise is God's going to send light into the midst of of whatever darkness you're walking into. It's something that he repeated multiple times. Isaiah 42, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I'll take you by your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people, a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. And if you know Luke, you know that Jesus said almost the same thing in Luke chapter 4. Isaiah 49, it's not too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, bring back those of Israel I've kept. I'll make you to be a light for the Gentiles, light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Yeah, that's so important for us to understand. Uh, This about, about life with Jesus. Darkness will descend. Guaranteed 100%. Darkness will descend into our world, into your life. But we're never left without light. And the hope of light in the darkness, the hope that the nation of Israel passed down from one generation to the next generation to the next generation, words that they committed to memory were the things that they held on to. The hope that the Holy Spirit made sure would never be completely extinguished. You see, the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, is intent on filling his people with hope even in the midst of the darkest times. He wants to speak hope into your darkness and give you hope. He's the spirit of the God of hope. And so some 700 years after Isaiah recorded these words from God, Luke in the New Testament includes the story of Simeon and his account of Jesus' birth. So let's flip over to Luke chapter 2, verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Now, we, we, this is the only thing we know about Simeon. It's the only place he's mentioned. Uh, but somehow this guy, he knew from the Holy Spirit that he wasn't going to die before he saw the fulfillment of the prophecy, before he saw the Messiah. Now, that probably made him a crazy person. You know, his, his friends would have thought he was weird. You know, the, yes, the whole nation was waiting for the Messiah, uh, but I'm sure this guy, he was talking about it and looking forward to it and, and talking about how the Messiah was going to come and they're going to cha- cha- change everything. And, and you know, It's like you run into somebody who's convinced that Jesus is coming back before the end of the year and you start wondering whether he's got everything all together. Simeon was that guy, except the Holy Spirit really had revealed to him that you're going to see the Lord's Messiah, the Lord's Christ, before you die. And so one day, Simeon, full of the Holy Spirit, he was abiding, resting, living in the Holy Spirit, and he walks into the temple courts. In verse 27, the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. And Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Yeah, you know, this is Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus for his dedication. This is this really weird. Can, can you 
imagine a, a few months from now, Emily, you, you and, uh, and, uh, coming and, and bringing, bringing your baby, and as you're coming in, some strange guy grabs your baby and, and lifts, him up, lifts him up in the air. You know, you'd, be, you'd be freaking out. <laughs> yeah, don't drop my baby. You don't know what you're doing. But Simeon takes the baby and begins to worship God. And he's full of joy and peace and his lifelong ambition, his lifelong longing has been fulfilled. This is the Messiah. Here he is, the fulfillment of the promise. This is the light of the world. The light that God has sent as a child. It fits the prophecy of Isaiah 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. Why? Drop down a few verses. To us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. All everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Jesus is that child. That son. The one whom we celebrate and we worship. We worship someone who was born as a baby. Born into this human race. We worship him as Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. You know, Jesus did not just come as fulfillment of hope for one nation, but he came as fulfillment of hope for all the world, for all people, for all languages. Jesus himself would say a number of years later in John 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You know, if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you don't know Jesus in that intimate sense today, that's his invitation to you. I am the light of the world. And if you follow me, you'll know my light in the midst of your darkness. Darkness will descend, but you'll not walk in it. Darkness will descend, but you'll have the light of the life. The psalmist said, his word is a lamp to your feet, a light to your path. Jesus has come and we need to allow the God of hope to fill us with his joy and his peace so we can abound with God's hope. That, that's, that's Romans 15, isn't it? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all we need to do to experience is that is look into the light of Jesus who's already come. So very quickly, uh, in the few minutes we have left, three, three things. Look into the light of Jesus and see first that every word the God of hope speaks comes to pass. Every word he speaks comes to pass. There's, there's nothing that causes, can cause a single word from the mouth of God to turn back void, to return fruitless. Every word he speaks come to pass. Doesn't matter what our perspective is. It doesn't matter what people say about his words. It doesn't matter how we try to reinterpret his words. God says, my words will return to me. And so how do we know his words? How can we know what they are? How can we know what he's spoken? What he's promised to do? What he's commanded us to do? What he's told us? How can we know his story? How can we know what our purpose is? How can we know what God's doing in this world? And so we need to be in, in God's word. We need to be reading his word. We need to be careful with them. We need to let the Holy Spirit, who's been in our brothers and sisters throughout church history, who've wrestled with, it, with what it says, begin to speak into us. You know, when we start to delineate between what we'll accept and not expect from God's word based on our current sensibilities, that somehow we've evolved more spiritually than others before us, that we're more in line than others is... Well, God's word tells us in the last days, hearts are going to grow cold and people are going to have itchy ears and will collect teachers to tell them whatever they want to hear. We don't naturally become more and more faithful to God. We become naturally more unfaithful to God because we tend to ignore his word. And so it's not a matter of always seeking after the new, but it's walking some of those ancient paths, ancient roads, ancient ways. Not from the 1960s or the 50s or the 40s, but from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, from the time of the, uh, of the disciples, the apostles, and seeing what they really say. It may seem backwards. It may seem upside down to our culture. 
But those first words, read the book of Acts, turn the culture, turn the world upside down. We need to know his words so we know what he's promised, so we know his promises, so we can know we can trust him. Second, we need to look to the light of Jesus and see that the God of hope speaks into our darkness. I don't know what is in your life right now, but you need to know that whatever darkness is there, your darkness is not dark to him. You can descend to the depths of the ocean, the psalmist said. You can descend to all the depths, and God is still there. As the psalmist says, you can go anywhere on planet Earth. In darkness, he's spoken light into the darkness. He's inviting you to fill your soul with what he's done, what he's promised to do. His light pierces the darkness. That's what Jesus came for, his light to pierce the darkness. It's not about hiding. It's not about putting on a show. It's not about pretending. It's not about suppressing anything distracting. It's not about, okay, I get a little extra time off or I eat eat some some nice foods or spend a little bit too much money or, or just pretend everything is good. No, it's about coming and speaking the truth and agreeing with God. And lastly, we look into the light of Jesus to see that we're still waiting. Every word that he speaks comes to pass. He speaks into the darkness, brings light into the darkness, and we're still waiting. And that's why Advent is a season of both looking back to that first coming of Jesus and to those prophecies that pointed to the coming of Jesus. And it speaks also of looking forward to the return of Jesus, to the consummation of the full kingdom of God. We look back uh, Jesus' first arrival, his being born as a baby. We look back at the story of his life and his death, his resurrection and his ascension, and we look forward to his return. Author of Hebrews in Hebrews 6 says, we who have this hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. This hope, solid, keeps us anchored. We need to look forward and look back because even now, darkness still covers the world we live in. We're living in this already but not yet redemptive history. People of light living in the darkness. We're in the world but not out of the world. And at times, it's a painful place to live. And God spoke in hope into this present darkness in the same way that he spoke hope to the prophet Isaiah and to the people of Israel then. He's told us that, that Jesus' first day had it was just the beginning. Our king is coming again. And when Jesus showed up, the people who had been expecting him were the least ready. The ones who knew the word the best didn't recognize them. We're going to talk more about that next, next Sunday. And so let me, let me ask a question as we end. What is it that separates those who immerse themselves in the word of God and were prepared for him from those who immerse themselves in the word of God and were completely unprepared? What separates those two groups of people? And it's really important for us to figure that out. And the promise is that Jesus is coming again. And we're going to look more at that next, one, next Sunday, as I said. It, it's really, really clear in scripture that the difference is surrender. Knowing the word of God, knowing the reality of hope does not spring into action in our lives, does not become real, does not, does not actually come alive in you, is not the sure anchor, anchor for your soul until you give yourself over to Jesus. And that's not just a one-time thing, it's a day-by-day, moment-by-moment thing. That's what Advent's about. It's the invitation of Advent. It's not just a story to remember, this nice story about a baby that was born and we celebrate that. Not just something to look forward to in terms of escapism from this world. It's not something that we disagree with. It's something we actually do. It's not just a a good idea. We actually have to surrender to him and walk in obedience and recognize that God is at work. There are things that are wrong in this world right now, but God is at work. There are things that are going right in this world right now, and God is at work. There are things that you can't control, and God is at work. And we give all of that to him. We agree with the psalmist. I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. These are all yours, yours, Lord, and I believe that you are good. I believe that you are at work, and I'm going to let go of my fears and my anxieties and my frustrations. And when we bubble up with anger, it's a sign that we're not letting go. My Lord, my heart is to let go. 
and you surrender and you let go. And sometimes we need to do that multiple times every single day. And so Holy Spirit, would you prompt us right now? Would you touch hearts and minds right now in this room and online? Show us how to surrender. Make it so obvious, Lord, that we need to give it to you. Make obedience so clear, Lord. Lord, I ask you to silence every voice that is not yours. To silence any spirit that is not of you. Holy Spirit, come and speak. Come and lead. Come and have your way. God of hope, fill us with joy and peace so that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we might be a people who abound in hope. That we might be a people who can connect the dots for our culture, for the people in our city and our world, and show them there's a substance to this. There is a foundation beneath all the packaging, all the glitter, all the lights. There is a reality here. And that reality is found in the person of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Lord, awaken us. Awaken OCC. Awaken your church in this city. Awaken your church around the world to live these realities. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Invite the worship team to come and lead us in our final song. Mike. Um, I'll just invite you one more time to stand with us and uh, let's sing the song The Lion and the Lamb to close. Jesus.
Judah, he's roaring with power and fighting a battle. Thanks everyone for coming, and I hope you have a great day. Amen. A couple of things quick. Remember, help for moving couches from Theater 1 to Theater 4, and don't forget to sign up for Mary, Mary and Joseph. Oh, yeah. Go with God's blessing.